much and good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, delighted to be uh, back in, in Malaysia and to uh, help join the celebrations for the opening of our, our new and I have to say very impressive office in, in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it was just over 10 years ago I first visited, although I've been, I've been a regular visitor to Malaysia over the last 30 plus years, I visited BSI for the first time about 10 years ago when we were no more than 12 people in a very small office somewhere else in town which I can't even remember where it is. So I'm delighted to see so many people here today in, uh, I think, an office that reflects uh, who, by, who BSI is today, but also who we want to be in the future. So all of you are extremely, extremely welcome. On the basis that a picture paints a thousand words, if I can just take a little bit of your time, I just want to show you a very, very brief uh, video, which hopefully explains a little bit more about, uh, about BSI and why we do what we do. So if we can start the video, please. challenges and opportunities that, that confront us as, as business leaders. Uh, as uh, David mentioned, I won't repeat it, um, you know, BSI has been around uh, a long time. And you see there some of the statistics about our, our global operation. So BSI Malaysia is part of a, a network of about uh, 5,000 people working with offices in 30 countries, but actually <coughs> clients uh, in almost every country in the world. Um, I'll always be proud to say, actually, we have clients on seven continents in the world. Yes, seven continents. We actually have a client in Antarctica. We do work, we do environmental management work for the Australian Antarctic Survey. And uh, every three years, one of my colleagues goes down there on a ship uh, in very cold weather to, to survey the site and come back again. So genuinely, we, we do have clients in, in seven continents. Not many organizations can, can say that. Um, but I think it's not about the, the scale of what BSI does. We're very focused on, on, on the impact. Uh, why? 
that we've been around 120 years and that heritage is very important to us, of course, it's what we're going to do today and more importantly, what we're going to do in, in future that you're really interested in. So the concept of resilience is, for us, is working with organizations like yourself to ensure that your organization, which may have been around longer than BSI, may have been relatively short-lived, uh, can, can pass the test of time, given all the pressures and challenges and opportunities that we're all faced with in our businesses today. The purpose video, we asked ourselves last year as a business, you know, we are um, a commercial enterprise, uh, we have to be, um, to, to be, to be sustaining. Uh, we have no shareholders as an organization, we are completely self-financing, so we have to generate a surplus to maintain and expand our operations. Quite an interesting uh, ownership structure we have. But we ask ourselves, not just as we grow as an organization, uh, what are we doing and, and how do we do it, but more fundamentally, what, why do we do what we do and why is an organization like BSI important? And the, the purpose statement of inspiring trust for a more resilient world is something we, we debated a long time internally, but I think it <coughs> captures, encapsulates everything that BSI stands for. In a, in a world where there's a, there's a deficit of trust, where increasingly uh, consumers are distrustful of, of business, where people are distrustful of politics, of the media, and many other institutions, uh, who, do you, who do you go to for an independent, honest expert opinion? to support your business. That is the role of BSI, an independent, uh, qualified, uh, impartial, high integrity organization uh, that can work with you in the long term to support and enhance your, your business. Our core values are integrity, respect, inclusivity, as some people call it, and the transfer of knowledge. We, we recruit and we train our people <coughs> to be the best that they can so they can share their sector or domain expertise with your business to deliver real, real outcomes. And the mission ultimately you see it there is to, is to help you, really your people and your organizations, as individuals and as a collective, to realize your, your full potential. And, and our ambition is always, um, in the wise, world, wise words of Aristotle, is to make excellence a habit. He was a very wise man 3,000 years ago. But I think the aspiration to always be excellent is something that I, I believe deep down that all organizations should fundamentally, fundamentally strive for. We are a Royal Charter organization. There are, are in the UK about 600 Royal Charter organizations. Um, I always like to say BSI is the second most famous Royal Charter organization in the world. Um, the most famous probably is the BBC. Uh, we're not the BBC, um, but I think in our field, we are the equivalent to the BBC. Uh, and the Royal Organization, and this, this, this purpose statement is actually lifted out of our Royal Charter that was granted to us in and I think it's, a, although the, the words might change, it's as relevant now as it was all those years ago. The other world might have changed, technology might have changed. We're now living in a globally interconnected world, but actually the foundations of BSI, the why we were set up, the bigger purpose of BSI, which is to serve society and the economy, uh, large and small companies, public and private sector, UK or international, uh, has, never been, has never been stronger. As David mentioned, we shaped um, 10 of the leading international management standards, which we're very proud of. Um, but we don't stand still, and we can't stand still. So part of these events are to make sure that we learn from you and listen to you about what's really important for your, for your organization so that we can anticipate future demands and shape that knowledge and those business tools that can really help your business uh, strive, strive forward. So when we talk about inspiring trust for a more resilient world, what do we mean? Um, there's really three words, I think, which helps me, uh, in my own mind, explain what resilience means. It's about safe in our world. It's about safe medical devices at the point of uh, the point of application. It's about safe food and making sure that our children, that our families, are eating safe and uh, safe food. Uh, it's about security in a digital world, making sure that our mobile devices, that our digital banking, that our information, that our assets uh, are continuously uh, secure. And above all, I think, and a big topic at the moment is sustainability. Uh, in Malaysia, we are the largest certifier of sustainable palm oil, for example. But sustainability in energy management, in resource efficiency, and the, and the circular economy are all areas that we are working on. So safe, secure, sustainable, that to me is the practical manifestation of resilience in an organization. And that's what BSI offers uh, to support your organization in some or all of those, those dimensions. Um, they've mentioned uh, another key uh, decision we took recently was to align our activities to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You will all be familiar, I think, with the 17 goals that were declared a few years ago as BSI. We signed the UN Global Compact uh, three years ago. We are committed.
committed as an organization uh, to work with organizations to help you and others achieve the outcomes for the sustainable development goals. And I'm sure that many, if not all of your organizations, have made similar de public declarations to support some of the sustainable goals that are relevant to your, to your activity. Uh, these are the seven that we, we are prioritizing. Uh, you know, we're still a modest organization, so we, we kind of work in all areas all the time, so we're focusing on, on these. Partnership is at the heart of what we do. Partnership with you, partnership with regulators and government, partnership with the trade association and membership bodies, uh, partnerships with organizations like ISO, where we were a founding member. Um, nobody can solve this the, the global challenges on their own. So we strongly believe in collaboration <coughs> and partnership, and that's at the heart of what we, we do. The goals 3, 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12, BSI already has a very deep knowledge and expertise and products, solutions, and services that can support your organization that may also be focusing on some or all of those other, other six goals. So if 3, 7, 8, 9, 11, 12 are right up there in terms of your organization's priorities, um, you know, BSR would like to talk to you and, and share our knowledge and expertise to make sure that over a long period of time we can deliver those really important um, outcomes that the planet and our human uh, society desperately, desperately needs. I don't think anyone <coughs> disagrees that this is not important. I think the challenge is not just to make the statement about commitment to the goals, it's actually to deliver real, meaningful outcomes. And our stakeholders all require us now to step up and not be part of the problem, actually, but become part of the solution. I think we all have a shared responsibility to address some of these fundamental issues of climate change, social inequality, for example, in the interest of, of humanity and our, and our planet. Uh, so I'm very proud, proud that we've decided to do that, and we look forward to uh, having a conversation with you about aligning our activities and your work But coming on to the concept of organization resilience, you may be familiar with the, with the concept, maybe not, so let me just explain a little bit about what is it and how does it apply to your organization and how might you go about thinking about applying this methodology or this framework to make your organization stronger and to survive and to thrive and pass the test of time. It's not a new concept in academia. Academics have been talking about resilience for, uh, for really most of this, uh, most of this century. Um, but, uh, as David mentioned, we, we publish or revise about 2,500 standards a year. And um, I'll be honest, I don't read all of them. Uh, I don't have the time, and some of them are quite thick. But once in a while, I ask my director of standards to, to, um, to share with me what he considers to be interesting and innovative standards. And uh, a few years ago, he, he dropped BS 65,000 on my desk, uh, a mercifully short standard, about 16 pages, which you can read in about, uh, about 30 minutes. And it was, it was an eye-opener to me. And I read it uh, as actually as a chief executive of a company. And it talked to me as a chief executive and all of the challenges that I have in, in running a global organization. I have a, a, a deep responsibility as a chief executive of 120 year old institution to make sure that BSI prevails and is there for future generations. It's, it's, you know, I'm a custodian of a great institution and I have my colleagues and our board have a, a very deep responsibility to make sure we carry on that, we carry on that work. This idea of an organization that doesn't just survive, <coughs> but actually thrives uh, and grows successfully is really, really important. And organization resilience, um, it's not a product. Um, <coughs> it's, not a, it's not a product we sell to you. It's a methodology, it's an, it's an approach to encourage organizations to think about um, the priorities for their organization, short term and long term but also balancing not just risks and opportunities. And I'm very mindful that many organizations today in an increasingly risky world are over-focusing on risk management to the extent that they may be stifling, stifling or inhibiting their organization's ability to innovate, create, and, uh, and therefore survive uh, over the test of time. The BS 65000 standard was created in the UK. Uh, like all our standards, it was shaped by a committee of experts we don't write the standards in BSI. We cannot be the experts on 37,000 standards. We mobilize experts on particular topics, and we facilitate the creation of a consensus standard. And when the consensus is reached, we publish it. And then through our activities, for example, here in Malaysia, we provide training and certification and advisory services to help organizations implement the standards into their organization and extract the, the value from it. 
This standard was actually initiated through the UK government. It was actually the civil contingencies involved in the UK government, which was concerned about uh, the impact of extreme weather, particularly in the UK, and the impact on civil society and on the economy. <coughs> Very quickly, it became all aspects of resilience. Um, it, it included um, threats to, of terrorism, for example, the threats of pandemics, very relevant at the moment, uh, the threats of IT uh, infrastructure failure, for example, and all the critical dependencies uh, for organizations large and small. And very quickly, this standard got a, a lot of interest uh, from a variety of, of organizations, and, and actually it's also been elevated to become an, an international standard. Um, so an interesting novel standard, just showing that actually standards are not just about products and technical specifications, and management systems, they're also about concepts. You know, standards can be applied almost to any business situation to harmonize, develop consistency, because what is a standard? It's just a repeatable best practice. It's a definition of, of good, which enables organizations to repeat it uh, habitually over, over time. The definition of organization resilience is there, and, and if you do have a chance to read the standard, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize it. Organization resilience is the ability, and the words here are important, the ability of an, of an organization to anticipate, prepare, and respond. Key word there is anticipate. This is not about crisis management. This is not about reacting to, a, to bad events when they happen. This is about having a mindset that looks forward, anticipates, and prepares, for instance, so that when bad things happen, or when opportunities arrive, your organization is culturally and organizationally ready to react. And I think, given the challenges we have at the moment with uh, uh, Corona or COVID-19, as it's now called, um, I think that some organizations are proving themselves to be very resilient in responding to this crisis, others less so. Um, adapt to incremental change and sudden disruption. Sometime change is imperceptible, it's very small, but over time it builds up. Sometimes it's a huge technological or regulatory disruption which uh, people don't see coming. And this idea of surviving and prospering, not just surviving, not just hanging on by your fingernails and risk managing the business, but actually uh, innovating and making yourself relevant uh, as, as an organization. So that's the definition of organization resilience, which you may be using this language in your organization. You may not be using this in organization. You may be practicing it, you may be thinking about practicing it, but we would encourage organizations to actually take this concept and actually you know, work in your organization and make it just part of your DNA because we believe this is fundamentally, you know, this will ensure your future future success. Uh, this is a slide I've, I've used quite a lot. It's a little bit outdated, but I think it's just as relevant. You know, history records all those great companies that people thought would be here forever, but are no longer, no longer with us. Um, you know, retailers, uh, technology companies. We all know stories about uh, Kodak Corporation, for example, uh, great companies that were conquering the world who uh, barely exist, uh, barely exist uh, today. Examples of that in Malaysia as well. It is true that the longevity of companies is getting shorter and shorter. Just as a segue, I, was, I saw something on the BBC last night, which was very <coughs> uh, an amazing statistic uh, that I read about. There are in Japan there are 33,000 companies in Japan that are over 100 years old. I think, wow, that's, that's incredible. And for those of you that know Japan, and I, I used to live and work in Japan, uh, you sort of it's not surprising, but it's, there are a lot of companies that have been around a long time. There's, there are also a lot of companies that have gone bust and, uh, and don't, don't exist. I think the message here is that no company has a right to exist. You know, just because you've been successful in the past doesn't guarantee your success in, in the future. So I think you know, your organization will be aware of that, that complacency is probably the biggest damper. And sometimes the more successful as an organization, the more risk you have, because the assumption is we're successful today you know, we will be successful in the future. Of course, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. And the fact that there are now companies, you know, companies like um, Alibaba or Tencent in China or Netflix or Amazon in, in the US, companies that we'd never heard of 20 years ago that are now you know, some of the top 10 corporations in, in the world just goes to show how much, how much the, world has, the world has changed. Um, but it's not just about risk. Currently, we're all wrestling, and Malaysia is no different, with the challenges of the, of the coronavirus, as it was originally known. It, it is having an impact, clearly, in China, but in an interconnected global world, you know, the impact I was in Singapore on Monday, uh, where 
you know, I've never seen the streets of Singapore so quiet. It was so easy to get a taxi in Singapore, uh, uh, which is almost unheard of. Um, this is having a material impact already on businesses, and even here in Malaysia, you know, supply chains are being disrupted, some working practices are, uh, are, are being changed. Um, you know, this is a real uh, crisis, and you know, there are examples there. You, you, you read the media organizations that are, uh, are having to deal with these consequences. The supply chains, the economic impact is still being calculated, uh, and the human impact is, uh, as well. But I, I wouldn't like you to think about organizational resilience just as a risk management or risk mitigation exercise. Yes, organizations have to identify and have contingencies for risk when they happen. But it's also about having an organization that's open-minded, uh, forward-looking, uh, and actually can, can think about um, what the world might look like in five or 10 years' time to prepare their organization for the future. And I think it's very relevant uh, that uh, we're here in Malaysia. So. I don't want to position organization resilience as doom and gloom. Here I am, somebody who's based in Europe, where we would die from this type of GDP growth rates in Malaysia. You know, four to six percent year on year compound annual GDP growth rates in Malaysia. Now, coming from Europe where you know we're, we're pretty pleased if we can get two percent, in some cases, anything positive, for example. So in the context of the Malaysian business, the context in which you're you're operating. I think the issue is, yes, we have to deal with crises and risk when they happen, but at the same time, we have to make sure that we're well positioned to capture and take advantage of and be part of this great growth success story. And is your organization doing enough to capture the upside? Is it open-minded to opportunities? Is it getting the balance right between risk and opportunity capture? And I think that's a, you know, that's a fundamental challenge for any, any business, and the organization that gets that wrong, if you go too far either way, risk or opportunity capture, it may not. Um, and it's different for every company. We're not suggesting there is a standardized approach to organization resilience. Every organization has to work out its own appetite for risk and opportunity. But I think in Malaysia, uh, the challenges are, 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 are quite uh, not unique, but special because you have to deal with risk, but at the same time, you have this wonderful, thriving economy full of opportunities and resource and talented people. Um, and a lot of other people also trying to invest and grow in that area. A highly competitive market, but full of rich, rich opportunities. So resilience very much talks to how you address this issue of, of opportunity as well as risk. I asked my team just to, to give an example of, of, of what they would consider to be a strong, resilient Malaysian business. And an organization that I'm very familiar with, uh, Simon Darby, also a, a client of BSI. Uh, um, it's been around almost as long as BSI. 10 years. It's had several um, iterations as, as a business, um, and now it's a diversified uh, conglomerate in, in motors, logistics, healthcare, industrial plantations, for example. And for those of you that know the organization, I think you know, there's a very strong, almost unwritten leadership and culture in that organization that has enabled it not just to survive, but actually become a very, very successful, not just a successful player in, in Southeast Asia, but globally. A great, a great success story, because it's reinvented itself many, many times. Um, the other story I've read yesterday on the BBC about Japan is actually about Nintendo. We all know about Nintendo. Our kids love to play on the Nintendo. My kids love to play on the Nintendo station. Nintendo actually was founded in the 1880s. I didn't know this. I thought Nintendo was a technology startup from 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> Nintendo uh, was founded as a playing card company. They used to print playing cards. Uh, and here we are, you know, more than 100 plus years later, and they're one of the leading gaming and technology companies in the world, and who knows what Nintendo will become in the future. And I think Sun, Sun Derby is, uh, is another very, very good example of that. Um, I think um, we can all learn from organizations like this, study what they've done, and I think what's, what's at the heart of strong, resilient businesses is, is uh, I think, a, a, a deep uh, knowledge of what they do and an appreciation of, of the value that they create focus on, on, on certain competences and skills and expertise, clear leadership, a positive, inclusive culture, and a willingness to take risks, but in a balanced and coordinated way. Um, so I hope you recognize the example there, and I'm sure you have other examples uh, of, uh, of, of Malaysian companies that are resilient, and I'm sure you all have stories of Malaysian companies that may no longer be here who didn't stand the test of, stand the test of time. 
So just to explain a little bit more detail, so the resilience framework, which I'll, I'll just summarize it here, I won't go into great detail. Um, we actually did this to ourselves. So I sat down with my management team and we engaged about a thousand people across BSI in a questionnaire and survey and mapped out our own appetite mm -hmm. of, uh, of resilience. Where did we think we needed to be uh, as a resilient organization on, on the 16 dimensions of resilience? And then where were we uh, today as an organization? And surprise, surprise, we found there were some gaps. For example, in one area, we realized that as a, a knowledge business, that uh, information and data security uh, was absolutely, absolutely essential. But our honest assessment was that as an organization, uh, we weren't as resilient in that area uh, as we needed to be. So that drove a big initiative in, in increasing our data, cyber, and information security in an organization. It's a very practical example of how this tool can be used in your business. It'll be different for every organization, but it's a, it's a process to step back uh, to think about where you where you are today and a, and a very honest assessment, including everybody in the organization, not just the top-down view, but sometimes the, the view from the front line of your organization is really, really important because you as leaders might think your, your organization is resilient, but sometimes our colleagues lower down the organization have a slightly different, maybe more informed view. So it's really important this is done across the organization. So you can map your resilience. Um, you can define and move towards where you are today to where you want to be. There's a methodology that we can work with you on to actually help, help deliver this. Uh, to talk about the tension quadrant, balancing the short and the long term, the operational and strategic, the risks and the opportunities. Um, that's that's the, uh, the practical concept of, of resilience. So we've created tools, not just the standard. We've created an index, which I'll show you in a minute. There's a benchmarking tool that can help you map out uh, your resilience against the, your desired profile. There are some academic research and benchmarking uh, tools that we've created as, as well. And some independent research that we've commissioned globally as well. This is not a, a concept from the UK. I think when we interview senior executives in Asia, in the Americas, across Europe, Africa, the Middle East, we find that the, the same challenges and opportunities are coming up time and time again. So these are global, global issues that we're talking about here. I've talked about the Resilience Index. Um, these were defined a few years ago as the elements of resilience um, and you know, we help you to map out your own resilience against those individual individual concepts. There are others, you can add to them, it's not um, exclusive. Um, we are going to do a piece of work now to map these to the sustainable development goals to actually migrate the organization resilience to reflect the sustainable development goals um, as well. Um, so these will, will change, but that's a, a checklist if you like uh, which enables your organization to assess assess your priorities, uh, to rank them, and to identify areas for, for improvement. Um, it's not a, an academic exercise, it is actually meant to be applied, and we've seen many organizations we've worked with take this methodology and drive a lot of new business performance improvement initiatives in their organization. And a lot of it is not about processes and systems, a lot of it is actually just about people. It's about creating um, a culture and an awareness of the organization this is about organization resilience. We're actually talking about the human element of the organization. We're talking about an organization that doesn't just have hindsight, it has foresight, uh, that it's open and collaborative, that it's innovative, um, that it's transparent, that risks are not buried, that there's a culture of bad news traveling quickly, but also an agility in the organization that enables organizations to innovate and respond quickly when, when things happen. Uh, so just to finish off, uh, the three domains of BSI, of BSI where we operate, uh, operational resilience, you see there on the right, you know, the solutions that we offer in certain areas of operational resilience. Um, I don't think there's any organization that thinks it has all the answers and it's perfect. Every organization I've ever worked in or worked with has always wanted to improve. So that, you know, underpinning every standard that BSI has is the principle of continuous improvement. You can be good today, but you can always be better operational resilience when it captures that. Information resilience, uh, many dimensions here as well. All of our businesses are now interconnected, are dependent on data, are throwing our information around in the cloud using multiple providers in a global digitally connected world. It's wonderfully powerful and enabling for business, but also there are a lot of bad actors out there who are trying to steal our assets. So again, balancing the opportunities of, of, of a, a digital world with the risks of, of the theft or loss of data, for example, is a fundamental approach. I think for every organization, I don't think 
any organization would dispute that this is not critical to their future success. And again, in an interconnected global world, the supply chain, um, we all have, whether we're in the services business or in the manufacturing distribution business or the agricultural industry, um, how do we ensure that your, you can be fine as an organization, but if your supply chain is not resilient, resilient <coughs> As for example, some of the automotive manufacturers like Toyota and Tesla are filing at the moment, uh, they have to shut their manufacturing plants because the supply chain has, has stopped and they don't have alternative contingencies. Um, easy to say, but it needs an, a systematic approach to map out how you can divert and adjust your supply chains when things don't go according, according to plan. So operational resilience, information resilience, supply chain resilience, those are the three domains of resilience. BSI is particularly well geared up to work with your organization on, and my colleagues here will be delighted to talk uh, to you about that. So I think it, hopefully it's clear. Um, I'm not here to lecture you. I think uh, I'm just trying to prompt you and, and, and raise awareness and get you thinking about the topic. But I think the benefits hopefully are clear to you about you know, why doing organization res resilience um, is, is not just a necessity, but actually is a business benefit. I think if you get this right, your brand, your reputation as an organization can be enhanced because people understand that you are, like VSI, a trusted organization. So you're here today, but they trust and believe that you're gonna be there for them in the future. And I think all of your stakeholders would uh, want some reassurance or confidence that your organization is doing all the right things today to make sure that you can stand the, stand the test of time as well. <coughs> so look forward to talking to you about the idea and sharing some thoughts. Um, be interested to know where you are on the journey to organization resilience, if it's a concept that you're familiar with, but look forward to talking to you about how we might be able to help you on that uh, on that journey. So without further ado, I will hand it back over to my colleague. Thank you for listening.